It's time for an awesome RTX 3070 gaming PC build for the very end of 2020 and 2021. I'm going to run you through all the parts I selected today and why, the build process step by step, including all the little fiddly bits, before jumping into some detailed benchmarks later on to see if in the wake of the 3060 Ti, this is even a system you should still put together. Let's jump into it though after a quick word from today's video sponsor. Today's video is brought to you by Remote HQ, a platform that allows teams to work together seamlessly as if they're in the same room. You can add and remove all the apps that you and your team do and don't need, positioning them exactly where you want them in your unique online dashboard. Plus, the app is completely web-based, meaning you keep your own systems nice and secure, and you can lock meeting rooms so that only the people you want in them can actually be there. What's more, it can automatically capture your meeting notes. Say here at Geeka Media, we're talking about, you know, video ideas. It can actually jot all these down for us to search through after the fact. So no one's got to worry about taking notes in the heat of the moment. There's also a feature which lets you all share the same browser, meaning you can share articles, sites and materials with one another seamlessly, making sure you're always on the same page quite literally. Head to the first link in the description below, remotehq.co forward slash geekawatt for a three month free trial. And then when you're ready to launch, make sure you use code geekawatt. It's a really great tool, especially for the virtual working world we're currently in. And thanks to them for making today's video possible. With all of my builds, we're gonna kick things off by installing as many components into our motherboard today as possible. This is the Gigabyte B550 Aorus Pro. It's available with or without Wi-Fi, you've got four RAM DIMM slots, which is great for dual channel memory, an AM4 socket, and then plenty of M.2 and PCIe expansion slots today. It's also got a built-in rear I.O. shield as well, which is just a nice premium feature that we're starting to see on more and more motherboards. The first port of call today then is to install our CPU. This is the AMD Ryzen 5 5600X. It is a beast of a CPU, not only for gaming with great single and multi-threaded performance, but also for a bit of video editing, bit of live streaming, bit of productivity use. This chip is absolutely in sane. And yes, AMD have hyped the price up just a little bit, but it's still a better value option than an Intel CPU at this price point. To install our chip today, we're just going to go ahead and pull up this arm on our CPU socket and then go ahead and drop the CPU pretty nicely into place. The arm's going to return back down and that really is all there is to it. It brings us quite nicely onto our RAM choice today. This is a 3600 megahertz kit of Adata's Spectrix D60G with some crazy RGB implementation that's also fairly low profile so shouldn't cause too many issues with coolers and other components today. It is the perfect choice. I'm a little bit of an RGB RAM fanboy as recent viewers will know so this is the perfect kit today. Installing the RAM is pretty simple we're just going to pull back the second and fourth RAM dim slot notches there we go and the ram's just gonna slide nicely into place a little something like that that was quite a satisfying click sound i'm rating that one today there we go there's one there's two and we're all sorted next up today then is our m.2 nvme storage and this is no ordinary m.2 drive it's the xpg s 40g and it has rgb on the top which is kind of crazy and believe it or not you don't really pay much more for the premium kind of edition of the RGB RAM. You're also able to control it through a load of different motherboard RGB suites in Windows. So yes, you can turn it off or just make it white if that's a little bit less obnoxious. This motherboard does come with these M.2 heat sinks built in, but I'm actually going to remove this one and leave it permanently off so that we can actually see the RGB of our SSD today. That's going to slide nicely into place with the XPG logo sitting here, eventually just above our graphics card today and secure down with this screw, which is pre-installed in the motherboard. Oh, where's it gone? Oh, there, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> there we have it. And the M.2 drive, the CPU and the RAM are all nicely into place today. And the motherboard assembly, as we're going to call it, is pretty well complete. Woo! Right then, it's now about time to get the motherboard assembly into the case. And this is no ordinary case. It's from Corsair. It's their IQ 4000X RGB. And you know what I need for this? I need some scissors. Scissors, there we go, exactly. Enthusiasm, Ooh. woo! There we go. So this is the Corsair 4000X IQ RGB. 
B, they do do this case in a mesh version. So if you're super duper obsessed about airflow, Corsair have got you covered. But all in all, I really like this case. It's a pretty premium offering at a price point that really isn't going to break the bank. You can build a slightly cheaper 3070 build than what we're putting together today. But as we'll come to, if you're trying to save a load of cash, the 3060 Ti is probably where you're positioning yourself anyway. So we can see at the front here, we've got this really nice tempered glass panel that actually clips off really quite easily. And there's a nice dust filter behind it that comes off like so. And you do get three included 120 mil RGB fans. So while there is a little bit more resistance with this glass panel up front, hopefully the temperatures shouldn't cause too much of an issue today. That was satisfying. If you then head around to the back of the chassis, you'll find a few things. You'll find Corsair's new kind of cable routing, cable management uh, system, which is quite nice. This included IQ controller, so you can add extra fans and not pay for a separate hub. And also you'll find, not that one, the one below it, uh, which has a brown box in. This includes all the accessories and stuff we need to install the motherboard and anything else into the case today. The most important of these bags are these kind of three little plastic ones. You've got fan screws on the end bag here motherboard screws in the middle bag and then tiny little kind of ssd screws in the end bag that has the least screws in it if that makes sense thankfully for us today if we take a look at the pre-installed motherboard standoffs they're in the perfect locations for a full-size standard ATX motherboard. And because that IO shield is already built into the board, it's simply a case of just sliding the motherboard in. The center standoff in this case as well is also raised, so that's gonna hold the motherboard in at least temporarily while we go ahead and secure it down with those included screws I talked about just a second ago. Okay then, with the motherboard now installed, I'm gonna do the power supply and some of our cables first because when we go and install that radiator, it could be quite hard to get the CPU power cables and other stuff plugged in. This is the Corsair CX750M. It's a semi-modular 80 plus bronze certified power supply that isn't going to break the bank. Much like graphics card and SSD and RAM and CPU pricing, these are a bit all over the place at the moment. As you can kind of tell, pricing across the industry is a bit, was well, a bit not great really. Um, but this is going to be one of the better value options on the market. And the semi-modular interface means you only plug in the cables that you really need. You get a 24 pin and a CPU power connector by default which means we just need to add in one of these dual 6 plus 2 pin graphics card power cables and finally a SATA power harness, a little something like this. The first of those two cables today are our CPU and motherboard power connectors. CPU goes to the top left of the motherboard, a little something like this and the motherboard power cable goes to the right hand side of the motherboard, once again like so. We're then just going to follow these up with our front panel cables today and spoiler alert, there's quite a lot. The first is HD audio for our headphone and mic jack and that goes at the bottom left of the motherboard. Next up is USB 2 which powers and controls the IQ included RGB fan hub and that goes to a USB 2 header. It looks similar to HD audio but has a different pin blocked out. The JFP1 front panel cables are next. These go to the bottom right of the motherboard. Do be careful because these are fiddly but I'll pop a diagram on your screen now to try and make this as easy as possible to follow along with. USB 3, uh, the normal type A variety is next. It is notched so we'll only going one way round and the pins on your motherboard can be quite delicate and that goes to the right hand side of the motherboard a little something like this Okie dokie, with the cables nicely out the way, the next step is to install the CPU cooler today. This is the IQ H100i Elite Capellix. It's one of the latest entries to the market from Corsair. I've used it once or twice before, and safe to say I've been pretty impressed. You get some really nice included RGB fans. Really quite a heavy radiator, actually, as well as a CPU cooler top plate that can actually be changed from white to black or black to white, etc. etc. We're going to be using in this bag of AMD AM4 hardware today and this CPU cooler actually leverages the pre-installed stock mounting hardware that you'll get with your motherboard so it should be nice and simple today. As you can then see we've just got these brackets that come included that literally slide onto the edge of the cooler like that and then these kind of square cutouts will actually go around the pre-installed mounting hardware. Before we do that though it's probably worth actually screwing the CPU cooler into the top of the chassis which is going to make our lives that little bit easier. Okay then, now that that's all sorted, it's finally time to go ahead and install the graphics card. Although I am quite concerned because <laughs> this box feels quite light. So I hope Gigabyte have sent it over with something in it. Ah, there is indeed a card inside. This is the Gigabyte Eagle card and this is one of the better value 3070 options 
on the market today. I'm gonna cover exact performance details a little bit later and discuss the gap between this and the 3060 Ti that for the price point might not be all that worth the upgrade. If you are gonna go the 3070 route though, which has more legs at 1440p and especially 4K, then going for a cheaper, better value 3070 is the way to go. Rather than spending say $529 on a Strix 3060 Ti, which is kind of just a little bit in same. This Gigabyte card's pretty nice. We've got this nice backplate at the rear, a triple fan cooling design. I believe this is kind of the replacement for the Windforce, at least at the budget end of the market. And all in all, a price point that really can't be complained about. To find out which slots we need to use to actually install this today, we're going to hover it over that top PCIe slot. And that reveals that we need to remove the second and third PCIe slot covers. There we go. And with that done, we're just going to remove our PCIe slot cover today. Make sure the retention clip is pushed back and the graphics card is going to slide in a little something like that. We're then going to re-secure down this included thumb screw that we took out just a second ago, power our graphics card up and then this build is ready for prime time and by that I mean we're going to boot it up, see exactly how it performs in a load of the most popular titles but first there's only one thing for it. Let's see just how good it looks when it's all powered up in an epic glam montage. Let's do this. Right then, now we've seen just how good this build looks when it's all powered up and of course the process of putting it together, let's take a dive and see exactly how it performs. Death Stranding is first up today and at 1440p high settings, with DLSS enabled you're looking at 158, 143 and 128 FPS for the average 90 and 99th percentile results, which is how I test all of my games. GTA 5 is next at 1440p high settings, using the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode, we achieved a very respectable 145 FPS on average, with 124 and 93 for the 90 and 99th percentile result. Control is next up and at between medium and high settings at 1440p with both RTX and DLSS enabled, you look in 77, 71 and 61 FPS and visually the game looked fantastic. Apex Legends is next up today then at 1440p medium to high settings, the sweet spot for a machine like this, you see in 164 FPS on average with 136 and 120 for the 90 and 99th percentile result, meaning the game stayed above 120 frames per second pretty much the entire time. Call of Duty's Warzone is next up then today before we look at the new Black Ops Cold War. Here at 1440p high settings we're seeing 135 FPS on average which is pretty insane at 1440p uh, with 118 and 105 following up in the rear. Call of Duty's Black Ops Cold War then the story mode is next up not the zombies today. 79 FPS on average at 1440p high settings with NVIDIA's lag busting reflex tech enabled, their frame rate increasing DLSS tech enabled and ray tracing which does drop your frame rate but changes light and shadows uh, that also turned on. 70 and 61 followed for the 90 and 99th percentile results and overall the game looked great. Next up then is Overwatch here at 4k ultra settings you see in 190 FPS on average with 173 and 161 for the 90 and 99th percentile our results, giving you esports level frame rates at 4K. CSGO is next up today then, I dropped the resolution down one to see just how high we could get that frame rate. And at 1440p high settings, you're looking 385 FPS on average, which is in Insane. Talking of insane, Doom Eternal. The numbers are absolutely all over the place today. In a good way, 1440p Ultra Nightmare looks like 216 FPS on average, which is absolutely ridiculous. 190, 191 and 169 for the 90 and 99th percentile results, though, show that average is no fluke. Rainbow Six Siege is next today, then the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode at 1440p, very high settings, not just high, very high. And here you're looking 200. 176 FPS on average. 
232 and 215 follow for the 90 and 99th percentile result, giving you more than a playable but very enjoyable gaming experience. Talking of really enjoyable, Valorant, that's the next title on my list today. One of the easier games to run along with, say, CSGO. And here at 4K medium settings, you're looking 359 FPS on average which is ridiculous. Talking of ridiculous, Watch Dogs Legions. I tested it uh, with both RTX off first up and then RTX on in just a second, both at 1440p and with DLSS enabled. 103, 89 and 73 looked pretty good for the RTX off result with the RTX on result lagging behind a little bit at 66, 62 and 59. Either way, the game looked great and was really playable, but ray tracing with all the light here, while it visually makes the game look great does have a significant performance hit. Talking of ray tracing performance hits today, the next two titles, Cyberpunk and Fortnite, are both RTX compatible titles. More and more are actually, and it's interesting to see this list being slowly taken over. Cyberpunk 2077 though, first off with high uh, settings across the board and RTX and DLSS both enabled, gives you 55, 49 and 41. Ouch! Cyberpunk is such a difficult game to run at that 1440p resolution. But don't worry, we've turned RTX off next up to see just if we can get that frame rate a bit closer to the 100 mark. I'm glad to announce we can, and at 93, 80, and 63 for the average 90th and 99th percentile results, this may well be the way to play this game for at least the time being. Fortnite then is my final game today. I always leave it at the end. You guys seem to love it though every single episode. And here at 1440p high with RTX off to begin with, gives you 223, 166, and 140 FPS for the average 90 and 99th percentile results. And then switching RTX off once again has quite the hit on our frame rate today. 51, 47 and 43, maybe with a 30, 70, 1080p if you want that ray tracing is the way to go in both Cyberpunk and Fortnite if we're being honest. With that being said though, that pretty much wraps it up not only for the gaming benchmarks today, but for the whole video. If you did enjoy it, you know what to do, get a big old like rating, get subscribed. Thank you very much for watching though, and as always, we will see you in the next one.